First of all, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Courtney Doggart. I'm the president of Network 2020. Welcome everyone today for our conversation with, uh, with Tom, Tom Graham uh, about Putin and the pandemic. We're very much looking forward to this conversation. Um, before we begin, for those of you who are joining who don't know about Network 2020, we're a New York-based nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that's trying to create informed conversations around foreign affairs. Um, I'm about to give you a little bit of information about our speaker today, um, but before I do, just a, just a warning that um, Brian from Network 2020 will be sending through your screen for those of you who've joined by, uh, by the Zoom link, just um, a brief poll about how you heard about this briefing. We're just trying to better understand, um, now that we're in the virtual world, who is joining us and why. Um, so if you would be so kind as to take that, we would, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, so today we are hearing from Tom Graham. He is a distinguished fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and is also currently a senior advisor at Kissinger Associates, where he focuses on Russian and Eurasian affairs. He is a co-founder of the Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies program at Yale University and sits on its faculty steering committee. He was special assistant to the president and senior director for Russia on the National Security Council staff from 2004 to 2007, during which he managed a White House Kremlin strategic dialogue. He was director for Russian affairs on the staff from 2002 to 2004. He was a lecturer in global affairs and political science at Yale University uh, from 2011 to 2019, teaching courses on US-Russian relations and Russian foreign policy, as well as cybersecurity and counterterrorism. He was a Foreign Service Officer for 14 years, with his assignments including two tours of duty at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow in the late Soviet period and in the middle of the 1990s, during which he served as head of the political internal unit and acting political counselor. Between tours in Moscow, he worked on Russian and Soviet affairs on the policy planning staff at the U.S. Department of State and as a policy assistant in the office of the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. He serves on the Kennan Council of the Kennan Institute of the Wilson Center and on the advisory board of Russia Matters, a project of the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, with the goal of enhancing the understanding of Russia among policymakers and the interested public. He also serves on the editorial board of the US Canada Journal of the USA Canada Institute of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Um, and he has a number of degrees, uh, a BA in Russian studies from Yale University, an MA in history, and a PhD in political science from Harvard. So as you can see, we are very lucky to be hearing from Tom Graham today about Russia. Um, so just to kick that off, um, I would want to turn it over to you, Tom, just for, if you could just give us um, a scene setter on the current COVID-19 situation in Russia. Well, first of all, Courtney, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, I'm really honored to be able to, to talk to you and your, uh, and your members. Uh, let me give you the, uh, to start sort of the bare statistics on the, uh, on the COVID crisis. Uh, we have over 440,000 known cases in Russia at this point. Uh, the official death tally is around 5,400. I'll get back to that uh, in a minute. Uh, the, the country appears to have passed its peak about three, uh, three weeks ago. At that time, there were 10 to 11,000 cases per day. Uh, for the past two to three weeks, we've had uh, around 9,000 cases uh, per day. This puts Russia uh, third in the world in overall cases uh, behind the United States and Brazil. Uh, like many other countries, uh, Russia had a lockdown. Well, they didn't call it a lockdown. They called it non-working days. Uh, paid holidays of a, of a sort that started at the, the very end of March uh, and ran through May 11th. Uh, and since that time, uh, the various regions of Russia have had the authority to begin to reopen uh, their, uh, their regions, depending on the, the local, uh, local circumstances. Moscow was hardest hit during the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, they are going to keep in this non-working lockdown mode uh, through the middle of June uh, at, the, uh, at the earliest and perhaps a little bit longer uh, than that. Uh, one of the things that has changed uh, in the geographic distribution of the, uh, of the pandemic uh, is that Moscow was the epicenter uh, for much of the, the early uh, weeks and months of the, of the pandemic. Uh, 
there are fewer cases now in Moscow, in part because an effective policy of quarantine and isolation, uh, and the bulk of the new cases that are appearing uh, are outside of Moscow. That may have some uh, implications for uh, the, the number of deaths that we see going forward, in part because the medical facilities in Moscow are, are much better, close to world standards. Uh, when you get farther away from Moscow, uh, you're still dealing with a very ramshackle uh, old Soviet system that hasn't had enough investment. Uh, and so we'll see how that impacts on, on things. Uh, the, uh, the lockdown has had the impact on economic affairs, as you would expect. It's been complicated in Russia by the uh, decline in oil prices. We know we've had a, a very unstable oil market uh, over the past several months, in part because of the corona crisis, uh, oversupply, uh, and so forth. So the combination of declining oil prices, uh, which is a significant part of the Russian economy, and the pandemic has led to a significant economic slide. Uh, the figure in April was a 12% decline uh, over the previous April uh, of 2020, 2019. Unemployment increased from 4.6% to 5.8%. Uh, you know, how much worse it will get or how much better it will get is a matter of, uh, of opinion at this point. Uh, most estimates for the overall decline in 2020, economically speaking, are in the 5 to 8% range. Uh, we see on the uh, oil markets are beginning to stabilize. Uh, the oil price is now back up to uh, close to $40 a barrel, which uh, was not too much lower than it was before the, the sharp plunge uh, in the spring of this year. Uh, so the economic situation uh, is getting a, a little bit better. Uh, on the political side, and we'll talk about this a bit more uh, in detail, uh, the, a constitutional referendum and a military parade celebrating the 75th anniversary uh, of the victory over Nazi Germany had to be postponed because of the crisis. They are now rescheduled for July, uh, excuse me, June 24th for the victory parade and July 1st for the constitutional referendum. Now, let me just speak a little bit about the mortality uh, statistics, because that is what's raised uh, a great deal of skepticism uh, outside of Russia uh, and in segments of the Russian population. Uh, the death rate, uh, official death rate is about 5,400 at this point. That comes out to about uh, 44, 45 deaths per million population. If you compare that to the United States, for example, we're at 100, about 325 or so per million. So a, a stark difference between the, the two of those. Uh, there have been reports that medical workers have come down with the uh, virus and uh, died of the virus at much higher rates than elsewhere in the world, uh, 15 to 16 times. And so many people have asked, uh, can we really believe these figures? Are they accurate? Uh, is the Kremlin manipulating these for political purposes? Uh, when I look at this and uh, look at the, uh, the overall situation, uh, I come to the conclusion that the, that the Kremlin is not engaging in, in double bookkeeping. It's not presenting a, uh, a set of figures publicly that it knows not to be the case. Uh, that said, there are ways that uh, Russia counts the uh, deaths from, from the COVID uh, virus and the way those deaths are reported, that would tend to uh, produce a much lower figure. Uh, first, on the way they report the deaths. Uh, the deaths uh, in Russia are reported as a COVID-related death only if a doctor determines in an autopsy that the pandemic, the, the virus, was the primary cause of death. Um, so if you have cardiac arrest while you have COVID, uh, the, the cause would be listed as a cardiac cardiac arrest in, uh, in Russia, not as a COVID. That's radically different from the way we report this in the United States and most other places in Europe and many other places around the world, uh, where uh, if you have the, the virus and you die, uh, that is generally uh, identified as a COVID-related death. Uh, the second uh, is because there's some, some discretion in how you uh, label or identify the cause of death, uh, there is a certain amount of pressure on local officials and doctors to report something other than COVID as the primary cause. 
uh, they are well aware that the Kremlin doesn't want to hear bad news. It doesn't want elevated figures. And so there's probably a conscious effort to, to look for other causes other than COVID. And that overall tends to uh, reduce the, uh, the level. You know, that said, um, if you look at excess deaths in Moscow uh, in, in April of this year, we have the figures for that. Uh, it's about three times the number of COVID-related deaths that are officially reported. So if we take that as a measure of the underreporting and multiply Russia's figure by, uh, by, by three, you still get a number that is significantly less than the, uh, than the level in the United States. So the question is why, and I can go into more detail of that if you're interested. Sure. Just um, you know, I, I'd like to just stay stay on some of the COVID-related questions just for j just for a minute before we move on. And one, yes, I absolutely would be interested in um, in why what why you think that that the death rates are lower in Russia. Um, you know, I know you mentioned the excellent healthcare system in uh, you know Moscow in particular, but um, but w what other attributes would you would you give that? Yeah, there, that? There, are, there are a few things here that have, I think, reduced the spread and the number of deaths. Uh, first, Russia was very quick to close its border with China. Uh, it did that in January, uh, at the beginning of this year. Uh, it closed down all its borders in the middle of March, uh, much ahead of many other, uh, many other countries. Uh, it has done a significant amount of testing and well, was well prepared to do this, uh, particularly compared to a country like the United States. Uh, Russia does about uh, 80,000 tests per million. We're down now in, in the range of about 40, 40 to 50,000. Uh, and they've done that from the beginning. So that was a significant uh, factor as well. As I said, the hospital system in Moscow uh, is at European levels, American levels, and so you get better care there. That's why I, I made the caveat. We don't know what it's going to look like when it now that the, the epicenter is shifting from Moscow uh, into areas that are uh, much more poorly supplied as far as medical uh, technology, medical facilities are concerned. So that's something uh, to watch. Uh, and then the final reason uh, is probably simply geography. Uh, Russia is a big country, it's sparsely populated, uh, and the Russian population is not nearly as mobile uh, as the population, certainly in the large Western European countries uh, or in the, uh, the Northeast Corridor in the United States where we've had so many cases and a somewhat less cosmopolitan uh, center uh, than, again, the major cities in, in Europe and the United States. So I think all those factors together have led to a somewhat lower incident mm -hmm. of the COVID crisis, uh, virus cases as they would expect and also to a somewhat lower mortality rate. Mm -hmm. and, and just what, one more follow-up question on that. Um, obviously, we've seen in the United States that, that coronavirus and COVID-19 deaths have disproportionately affected um, minority communities and poor communities. Um, and I was just on a call the other day for a, a prep call for um, a similar briefing that we'll be doing on Latin America. And that's, you know, in that that's certainly the case there as well. I think particularly in Argentina, is that something that that they're seeing in Russia as well? Um, that that you know, I know you mentioned healthcare workers uh, have higher rates, but is that uh, across um, minority or poorer populations? Is that something that that Russia is seeing too? I haven't really seen statistics that would uh, that would address that issue. Uh, there is a uh, a large Central Asian diaspora. Uh, in, uh, in Moscow and other uh, major Russian cities that supplies a lot of the, uh, the, the workers at the uh, open air markets, uh, services and so forth. Uh, so one would expect that that's probably the case. But as I said, I've, I've seen nothing that would, uh, would back that up empirically. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, moving on, I, I think one of the big questions that everyone has when it comes to Russia and coronavirus is what the relationship is between this pandemic and and Putin's own authority. Um, so, so I'd be curious to hear from you. Um, how how has this affected his um, his his administration, his regime? Uh, I know I know you said um, the constitutional referendum has been postponed, but to still be be moving forward. Um, you know, has is there? Um, has this instilled confidence in him as a leader or has it eroded it? 
It's a very good question. And it's, there's always a complicated answer to a, a question like that um, to try to sort of um, extract or, or extract the, uh, the causes that are related to the pandemic and those are, are more broadly. But if you look at this sort of the broad picture, uh, Putin's trust rating, that is if you went to Russians and asked, uh, name a politician that you trust, um, in, 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 in 2017, 60% of the population would have said Putin. A year ago in June, asked that same question, they would have said 40% would have named Putin. At the beginning of this year, it was 28%. Uh, so you could see that uh, the level of trust was declining in, in Putin over the past several years. I mean, part of that has to do uh, with the very difficult socioeconomic conditions uh, for Russians. Uh, real wages, real disposal income hasn't uh, increased noticeably over the past six years. In fact, the decline for five years is a little bump up last year, it almost certainly go down this year. Uh, the euphoria over the so-called successes in foreign policy, the annexation of Crimea, uh, this very sort of spectacular military operation in Syria have worn off. And as polling indicates, Russians are much, much, much more concerned about the domestic situation, their own lifestyle, living standards, um, and Putin's ability to defect that. And that's impacted on the trust level. Now, Putin realized that. And one of the goals of 2020 at the beginning of the year uh, was to do things that would boost his popularity uh, with, the, with the broader population. So if we go back to January, he delivered uh, the equivalent of our State of the Union address. Uh, and traditionally, there's been a large foreign policy chunk to that. This is this year focused almost exclusively on the domestic situation and the programs that Putin was going to put in place uh, to help raise, uh, in particular, living standards. Uh, at that time, he also reshuffled the government uh, and brought in a, a government uh, that is billed as being much more professional uh, and charged them with jumpstarting the economy. And one of the things in particular uh, that he charged them with, with doing was implementing uh, in a more effective and efficient manner uh, the so-called, the 13 so-called national projects that he announced when he was uh, reelected in 2018. The national projects uh, are, are aimed at jumpstarting the economy, modernizing infrastructure, but most important of all, of raising living standards education, health, uh, public welfare, uh, for example. Uh, as I said, uh, there was a constitutional referendum uh, that was going to enable uh, Putin to uh, serve out to 2036. This was a way of uh, getting public support, a, a popular vote that legitimated his, uh, his rule as the paramount leader uh, for well into the future. And then finally, there was the May Day Parade, or not the May Day, the Victory Day Parade, uh, in the beginning uh, of May. Uh, the 75th anniversary of the victory over, uh, over Nazi Germany, a massive military parade, but most important, he was going to bring foreign leaders. French President Emmanuel Macron was going to be present, uh, Chinese leader Xi Jinping. So here was Putin going to be flanked by uh, these major world leaders uh, watching a military parade commemorating uh, Russia's uh, both sacrifice, but also its, its tremendous power, uh, display of new military equipment as well. And so a way of uh, sort of highlighting and validating Russia's position on the global stage, and most importantly, Putin's own stature uh, as a global leader. Now, all those things had to be postponed uh, because of the crisis uh, due to the, um, the virus. And we'll see what happens later on. Uh, Putin has been criticized over the past several weeks uh, for his hands-off approach to, to dealing with the uh, crisis. Uh, he was very slow to admit that there was indeed going to be a pandemic, uh, not dissimilar to what we heard. So in this country, many other places, uh, Putin from the beginning of the year, well into uh, March and in, even into April, uh, was saying that we had the situation under control. There was nothing to worry about. Uh, he delayed until late April uh, to postpone the military parade in Moscow. Um, finally realized that um, uh, you weren't going to be able to do this under safe conditions. Uh, and so I think he takes something of a political hit for that. 
Uh, he also very early on decided to delegate responsibility for managing the crisis to the regional leaders. Uh, you know, generally you would expect in a crisis the president to be out front uh, doing this. Uh, he delegated it. Now, you could argue that that was actually the smart thing to do uh, because conditions vary across the country. Local leaders have a much better idea of what the conditions are, what needs to be done, what the population will support. Uh, but that said, it runs counter to the way you think uh, a Russian president in particular would deal with the crisis. So if we look at the last polls uh, on trust in Putin, it's down to 25%, a uh, historical low for Putin. Uh, but that's 28% in January to 25% uh, in May. Is that, um, if that's due to the crisis, that's not really a significant drop. Um, so we'll see. Uh, and we'll see very quickly because, as I said, we have the military parade on uh, June 24th, followed by the referendum on July mm -hmm. 1st. Now, just a word on the referendum and not so much on what's in the referendum, but how to think about the results of the referendum. Uh, there's no doubt it's going to pass. So, uh, as I always tell people, don't pay attention to the margin by which it passes. The really important figure here is turnout. That is how many people are prepared to go to the polls to vote in effect for Putin, and how many of them are prepared to do it uh, under conditions where they still may be somewhat concerned, if not deeply concerned about the, the pandemic and its implications for their own personal health. Uh, the benchmark is the presidential election in 2018, which had a 67 to 68% turnout. 77% of those voted for Putin. Uh, he really needs to get something close to that figure on the turnout this time for this to look like a major uh, political victory and a revalidation of Putin uh, as an important leader. And then the final point uh, I would make on this is we shouldn't pay uh, too much importance to popular trust. Remember, this is an elite-based system. The important thing is not so much what the population at large thinks about Putin, but what it is what the elite thinks about Putin uh, and his ability to manage this country, to protect um, the, the elites from foreign enemies, protect the elites from mass uh, uh, unrest and protect the elites from themselves. Um, and at this point, uh, he is more or less managing that effect of us. We don't see massive signs of elite dis uh, discontent. So, and then one final point here, which I think is also important. Uh, how Putin comes through the crisis uh, into the fall uh, will be a major determinant of, uh, of his political strength. Uh, now, the economy is going to decline. Uh, the pandemic has taken a toll. But remember, uh, we've got to look at this in comparison. It's not only Russia. How does Russia compare to other countries? And that's why the Kremlin likes that low mortality figure, would like to keep it low. Uh, the comparison points to the United States, uh, Europe. Uh, and if, you, if Putin in September, October can say, yes, we went through a difficult period, but look at the United States, look at Western Europe, uh, five to 10 times the number of deaths uh, because of the crisis, we actually managed this quite well. Uh, that is a... Um, because of the, uh, the, uh, the strength and stoicism of the Russian people, but also by implication because of good leadership. All right, th th thank you very much. It's, it's helpful to, to hear. So it sounds though, even though you have declining popularity numbers, what really matters is what that elite group thinks. And, and so yeah. those declining popularity numbers have basically nothing to do with what happens at the polls. I think that's absolutely right. And again, the, that's why turnout's important because the elites mm -hmm. are uh, the people who are charged with getting the people to the polls. Mm -hmm. um, uh -huh. And if they can't get to the people, the people to the polls, it indicates significant popular resistance or an unwillingness, excuse me, mm -hmm. or an unwillingness uh, of the elites to do what they need to do in order to, uh, to bring people out to the polls. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so, so I'd, I'd like to, you know, we're 
we have some questions coming in, but but I'd I'd like to just ask a few more myself, and then we'll and then we'll turn to the Q and A box. Um, I'd like to just stick on the economic piece just for just for a few minutes. Um, I mean, obviously, I know Russia depends very much on where oil prices are in the world, um, and and they had as, as if I understand correctly, they they, they had a. A, a nice reserve for a while in terms of cash reserves, but that had been declining. Um, and in conjunction with that, you mentioned his 13 points and, and this idea of economic reju rejuvenation. Um, could you talk a little bit about how those are connected and you know, is, he pos is it possible to jumpstart the economy now? And what were his ideas to do that? Well, 13 national projects uh, were supposed to uh, uh, inject $400 billion into the economy over several years, very specific sectors, uh, but that was simply what the, uh, what the national government was going to put in the project. Uh, this was also supposed to attract a significant private sector uh, investment as well. And if you know how uh, Russia works, if the Kremlin asks the private sector to invest, uh, many times they will decide that it's probably a good idea to invest. Um, so that was um, part of it, putting money into uh, important projects that would help stimulate the economy, but also putting them into projects um, that would help um, uh, improve the efficiency of the economy. So a lot into infrastructure, roads, for example. Uh, there's a lot in the digital side uh, as well, improving the access to the internet and the efficiency with which that uh, works. There were specific projects that were focused on uh, scientific development, uh, raising productivity, and so forth. So that was a cluster uh, of projects that were going to stimulate the economy. Uh, also, with the pandemic, uh, as you've seen elsewhere, uh, an effort to put some money in to, to deal with the, the problems of unemployment, to, to keep some businesses going through the pandemic so that they would be in a position to rehire people. Uh, once the, the, the virus subsided. Now, the amounts that Russia has put in uh, pale in comparison uh, to the amounts put in by the United States, for example. Uh, our stimulus package is um, north of 10% of our, our GDP. Uh, Russia's now is in the range of three to four, maybe 5%, so significantly less. Uh, and part of that, in a strange way, is um, Putin's concern uh, that he's had since he uh, rose to power in, in, in the year 2000, uh, maintaining macroeconomic stability. Uh, not, there's still this great fear of inflating the economy uh, too rapidly in ways that it spins out of control and that Russia finds itself uh, in a position where it has to go outside for, uh, for support in some way. And one thing that Putin and the Kremlin are focused on is maintaining what they see as Russia's sort of economic independence and autonomy at this point, that they're going to generate the resources internally that they need uh, in order to, um, uh, to move forward, that they're not going to become over-reliant on external sources of financing. Okay, great. Um, so I was going to ask a question about foreign policy, but I think I'm going to skip that um, so that we have, uh, so I'll ask one more before we go to the Q&A and maybe those who are listening will, will ask about Russia's foreign policy. But, um, but, I, but, but before we turn to the Q&A box, I did want to hear from you about um, US-Russia relations and where you see those going, um, particularly with the US presidential election coming up in the fall. Yeah, I mean, the short answer is the relationship, the relationship is bad probably as bad as it's been since the, uh, since the early part of the 1980s, later part of the, the Cold War. Um, you know, there was an effort, I think, by the Kremlin to reach out at the beginning of the pandemic crisis to talk about, well, uh, let's see if we can cooperate on, the, uh, on dealing with the pandemic. Uh, that didn't go over well. Um, there's no indication uh, that the political class in the United States uh, is prepared for a closer working relationship with Russia to normalize the relations. Uh, we've got senators now talking about letting additional sanctions on Russia. Uh, and of course, as we get uh, deeper into the election campaign, uh, this continuing concern about uh, whether and how the Russians might interfere and what implications that would have 
uh, for, for the election. Uh, finally, uh, the issue that is, uh, I think, of prime importance to Russia at this point, and that is the extension of the New START Treaty. Uh, it expires in, excuse me, in February of 2021. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the treaty that puts a limit on our, our nuclear forces, uh, caps them, also provides for a verification uh, and monitoring system that gives each side confidence that the other side is, in fact, honoring its obligations, very important to maintaining strategic stability. Uh, the Trump administration has uh, not indicated great enthusiasm about doing that, um, and they've created what the Russians consider it to be a diversion. That is, uh, President Trump has said, if we can bring China into the conversation, uh, maybe do a trilateral deal, uh, then, uh, then I might be uh, willing to go forward. Uh, the Russians realize that the Chinese have no interest in, in joining a treaty at this point. The Russians don't want the Chinese in, uh, in, in an agreement in any event. And so that is stalled at this point. Uh, my sense from talking to, to my Russian colleagues is that they don't expect a great deal to change after the election uh, this November. I might have a slightly different view on that. Uh, but the relationship is uh, in bad shape. It is fundamentally competitive. Uh, and no matter who wins in November, it's going to continue to be competitive. The big question is whether we can stabilize the relationship, mm -hmm. prevent it from deteriorating further from uh, the very low state it's at at the moment. And, and, and just to follow up on that briefly, um, I mean, obviously, diplomacy is something that is usually done face to face. Um, and even prior to the pandemic, which has really cut off that, that ability, um, I mean, the, the U.S. Embassy in Moscow has been, I think, you know, decim more than decimated. Um, and, and similarly, I, I assume here in, in the U.S. with, uh, with Russian representation. Right. So um, already there, there was shaky ground for the ability to have face-to-face -face talks and build those trusted relationships. And now that has completely eroded. So how, how does one conduct negotiations in a time of pandemic when it's already coming on top of a diplomatic? It's a, it's, it's a good question. It's very complicated. Now, if all you want to do is extend the START Treaty, that's fairly easy uh, because there, you don't need to have a detailed discussion about that. Uh, but if you want to get into uh, a, uh, a deeper discussion of, say, strategic stability, what is it? Uh, how is the um, strategic environment changed over the past? Um, 10, 20 years, uh, how do we deal with multiple nuclear powers? How do we deal with um, cyber weapons uh, and the ability that that provides to both interfere in domestic affairs of other countries, but also to blind uh, certain uh, strategic assets and so forth? Uh, that requires uh, a much more intensive negotiation uh, and to solve some of the, um, the really knotty issues, it's good to have uh, develop relations of trust between the key negotiators. And you usually do that uh, through face-to-face, -face, uh, not only negotiations, but you know a lot of what you do outside the, the formal no negotiations, the talks in the corridors, the dinners and so forth, uh, which will be unavailable at this point. There's one other thing that makes it complicated uh, specifically with the uh, US-Russian relationship at this point. Uh, and that is, uh, there has been a rapid turnover uh, in the individuals in the, uh, in the Trump administration that deal with, uh, with Russia. Uh, many of these people not uh, well known uh, to counterparts, their counterparts in Moscow. Now, in a different situation, if these people have been dealing with one another for three or four years, uh, even with the limitations uh, caused by the pandemic, uh, you would be able to get some uh, some business done. If you have to, in fact, meet people for the first time over Zoom, for example, or its equivalent, uh, you've added another hurdle, an obstacle uh, to developing that relationship of trust, uh, which is really the grease that uh, carries negotiations forward. All right. Well, that's um, a, 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 a somewhat difficult note to end on, but hopefully there Hopefully at some point soon, we'll be able to resume those those face-to-face -face conversations. But um, you know, at, at this point, I'd like to just turn to the Q&A box because we do have some questions coming in. Um, and for those of you who are listening, who would like to ask a question, uh, feel free to put it in the Q&A box. You can also email Brian at B-T-H-A-N-G at network20.com.
Zero.org if you are calling by phone, or you can also raise your hand if you would like to ask it live. So um, the first question is, um, what are some strategies Russia has implemented to keep its COVID-19 mortality rate low? Um, okay, well, actually, I, I do believe that, that you addressed this one already. Um, so I think we'll move on probably to the next one, just because you did talk about some of those unique factors in Russia. Um, the next question is uh, regarding Belarus. So do you have any insight or opinion into the unique handling of the pandemic in Belarus? They have a very close geopolitical relationship with Russia. Um, however, in Belarus, the president and government simply deny the existence of the virus. Doctors are dying, people are dying, but there is no reporting. Um, so what do you think about uh, what's happening in Belarus, if, if you have any in, insight, and, um, and what do you think that Lukashenko is gaining from this approach? Yeah, I mean, I don't have a great deal of insight uh, into the Belarus. Uh, I don't have the numbers at my fingertips, mm -hmm. uh, but you're absolutely right. President Lukashenko uh, basically has denied that this is a problem. He held his uh, military parade um, on, uh, on May 9th, uh, unlike the Russians. Um, uh, in fact, basically claiming that the Russians were, were wimps for not doing this um, mm -hmm. and has uh, undertaken no serious effort to, um, uh, to, to limit the, uh, the, the spread of the virus in, in Belarus. So I want to assume that the situation uh, is, is somewhat worse there, although I haven't seen the, the, the figures. Uh, just mm -hmm. one sort of general comment here. Uh, interestingly enough, the, the figures in much of Eastern Europe have been lower than in Western Europe mm -hmm. uh, in terms of incidence and also in terms of mortality. Uh, and, you know, some of this has to do with uh, uh, factors that I've already talked to about with regard to uh, Russia itself. Uh, these are not as densely populated as, uh, mm -hmm. in general, they're not as mobile, uh, mm -hmm. and they're not as connected to the outside world. Uh, so what has really sort of uh, driven these numbers uh, in places like New York City, London, um, uh, Paris, and elsewhere is the fact that you've got so much mobility, people coming in from all over, uh, which made it very difficult to, uh, to contain this crisis uh, at the very beginning. You don't have that same mm -hmm. uh, problem in a place like Russia. You don't have that problem, same problem in a place like Minsk. But unfortunately, I don't really have the, the empirical data here to give you a much better answer on mm -hmm. what's happening in Belarus. Okay, th thank you. Um, so, and the next question actually does address foreign policy and whether or not the pandemic has affected Putin's ability to conduct foreign policy. And I would just like to um, tag on to that for a little bit just to see, you know, if you could expand a little bit on how this has impacted um, Putin and Russia's efforts in, in um, conflicts abroad, you know, Syria and yeah. um, Ukraine come to mind, yeah. but please feel yeah, exactly. free. That's, you know, it's a, it's a good question. Um, and, you know, as I said earlier in my remarks, um, the, the foreign policy, the foreign policy activism uh, does not uh, come with the same sort of popular boost as it did uh, uh, four or five years ago after Crimea, the initial incursion or intervention uh, in, into Syria. Uh, and Putin knows that he needs to pay more attention to domestic affairs. Uh, Russia has also gone through a very rapid modernization of its military over the past decade. Uh, probably has to pull back on that to a certain extent. But as, what is interesting, however, is so far uh, we've seen very little that has indicated a less active Russian foreign policy. Um, they're still engaged in Syria. Uh, nothing has really changed on Ukraine. You haven't seen uh, the Russians come up with a, a different formula, more flexibility, uh, certainly not a, a, an urgent need to resolve that uh, conflict at this point. You look at Libya, uh, the latest reports that its Russians have uh, escalated their, uh, their participation. They're sending four MiG fighters at the Haftar's uh, forces one of the uh, warlords on the ground that is uh, fighting over control for Libya at this point. Uh, we haven't seen a, uh, any effort or significant enduring effort to normalize relations with Europe uh, or with the United States. And so the foreign policy has pretty much uh, continued uh, the way it, uh, it had before. Now that, is, doesn't say, that isn't to say that um, the pandemic uh, 
hasn't had an impact on Russia's foreign policy, where we might be see the consequences of this, not immediately, but sometime over the next uh, several months or next couple of years. Um, to take, a, I think, the, the prime example, uh, Russia's relationship with China. Uh, Russia had uh, built a very close relationship with China, has over the past, in particular over the past six years. Putin and Xi talk about the strategic alignment. Uh, they both claim that uh, Russian Chinese relations are the best, as they, the best they've ever been uh, in history. Uh, there's probably some truth to that. Uh, but Russia has always been concerned uh, about an over reliance on China. Uh, if you look at the asymmetries in the relationship, uh, the demographic imbalance, uh, the difference in economic growth rates, the difference in the size of the economies, uh, the difference in actually the technological prowess. Uh, of the two countries at uh, this point. All of those are in China's favor and tilting more in China's favor uh, over the long term. So the issue that Russia has faced for some time uh, is the question of how Russia maintains its strategic economy. How do you uh, prevent yourself from becoming a uh, sort of a junior partner uh, to China following China's lead on the, uh, on the global stage? And that has been, uh, this issue has been exacerbated by uh, the COVID crisis because of the intensification of the competition between the United States and China. Uh, obviously, it was very competitive before that. The virus uh, has added another element to that, one that Washington is pushing very heavily on the Chinese uh, from their side as, as well. Uh, and so there's this fear in Russia uh, that uh, we are moving towards a bipolar world uh, and that countries will be uh, forced to choose sides between Washington and Beijing, the last thing that it wants to do. Uh, and so how do you maintain your strategic autonomy? Uh, how do you hedge against becoming over-reliant on, on China, but in a way that doesn't alienate the Chinese who are still uh, a close neighbor uh, uh, who, with whom a good uh, good relationship is is critical to Russia going forward. Um, and I think that comes down to how do you normalize relations with the West, first of all. Uh, right. uh, and uh, as I said, we've seen no flexibility on the Russian side at this mm -hmm. point. Uh, but as the competition between the United States and China intensifies, um, as Russia is, is compelled to make certain choices on technology that lean one way or the other, I think the normalization issue will come mm -hmm. rise to the fore, and that will provide uh, Russia with a, uh, a real diplomatic uh, problem, complex problem. How they'll solve that, I think, is an open question. Mm -hmm. and, and, and two sort of unrelated um, follow-up questions to that. One is, um, you know, what do you make of Trump's um, proposal to invite Russia to sort of an expanded G7? Um, and then, just to stay on the Russia-China relationship a little bit, um, you know, if if you could just talk about that a little bit more and what that looks like, particularly in the East, because I, I think my understanding is is that there's also some some fairly significant demographic shifts going on over in the eastern part, closer to China. Well, let's start with Trump's uh, G7 initiative. Remember that he has wanted to invite back Russia back into the G7, recreate the G8 uh, for some time. Uh, to what extent that's a serious proposal, to what extent that is a, an effort to deflect attention from the fact that it doesn't get along with the other G7 leaders, uh, I think is an open question. Uh, but what I can say is, uh, you know, inviting Russia to come to a G7 meeting, I guess a virtual meeting in September, uh, along with um, uh, Indians, the Indians, the Japanese, uh, the South Koreans and the Australians have talked about forming an anti-China um, China coalition uh, is a non-starter. It's a non-starter for the Russians. Uh, it's also a non-starter for all the other countries that um, the president was thinking of uh, inviting. So if those are the condition of those are the terms. The Russians uh, would not want to show up um, uh, under those circumstances. Uh, it's also clear that the other G7 leaders are not uh, to put it uh, mildly enthusiastic about um, 
uh, about Putin showing up at a, G8, uh, a G7 meeting. Uh, so I think that's something of a non-starter at this point. Uh, we'll see how, how Trump uh, manages that. Uh, you know, Russia's relationship with, uh, with China, you know, as I said, it has grown closer over the past six or seven years in particular because of the rupture in relations with the West, the United States, first of all. Um, China has become Russia's largest trading partner, uh, its largest um, sort of defense to defense, military to military uh, partner. Uh, the Russians and the Chinese have begun to conduct joint strategic exercises, something that is new. Uh, and Russia is selling the, the Chinese some fairly sophisticated military technology uh, that just a, a decade ago they would, would, they would not have considered. Uh, they're also allowing Chinese investment uh, in strategic assets inside Russia, again, something that they wouldn't have allowed uh, just uh, four or five years ago. So it is a much closer relationship. Uh, you know, there is a demographic imbalance in the East. Um, there has been for, uh, actually for, for centuries, if you want to put it that way. Uh, but if you bring out your sort of mental map uh, of Russia, and you know where Lake Baikal is located, um, about two thirds of the way across Russia, starting from Europe going to the Pacific, or from Lake Baikal to the Pacific Ocean, there are about six to seven million Russians. Uh, across the border in Northeast China, uh, there are about 120 to 140 million Chinese. Um, there are uh, a large number of Chinese that are engaged economically uh, in the Eastern part of, uh, of Russia. Uh, there's always a fear, uh, I think overblown, but a, a fear nevertheless in the Russian imagination of them being overwhelmed uh, by the Chinese. That does create some sort of tension uh, in the relationship. Not something that you would necessarily feel in Moscow, uh, but something that you would be much more aware of as you get into the farther reaches of, uh, of Russia itself. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, how they're going to manage this over the long run uh, is, a, uh, is a challenging question. If you want to develop the resources uh, in Eastern Siberia, the Russian Far East, you're going to need investment, you're going to need labor. Um, the nearest source of labor is Chinese labor. Um, how you integrate them into the, uh, into the, uh, into the economic uh, membrane of, of that part of the world, I think is a big challenge. And then finally, I think the strategic challenge is, uh, you know, uh, that Russia faces the economic future of the Russian Far East is in Northeast Asia, right? That's where the, um, that's where you have growing economies. That's where you have the population growth. Uh, you're going to have the economic growth. Uh, these are large and vast economies uh, that are going to soak up the resources uh, that Russia has. Uh, and the question, and I think people in the Kremlin ask this, uh, is what are the long-term implications of the Russian Far East integrating economically uh, and in Northeast Asia. Mm. What does that mean for Russian sovereignty? And sort of the challenge for the Russians is to make sure that uh, a city like Vladivostok, even as it's integrating into this regional economy in Northeast Asia, is still looking back to Moscow mm -hmm. uh, for political purposes, for its security and so forth. So building up the lines of communication between European Russia uh, and the Russian Far East is a critical mm -hmm. challenge going forward. That's where the infrastructure becomes an important question. Mm -hmm. um, not sufficient infrastructure at this point. Uh, Putin had hoped to, to work on this. We'll see if he can actually put the resources to that. Yeah. I, I, as a student of Russian history, I always loved how almost every lecture starts with um, some sort of imagery or ability to try to capture just the, the geographic magnitude of Russia. And, and, uh, and, and I think that's, it's, it's such a, an interesting challenge and one to think about. Um, our next question is, um, I'm going to skip around a little bit, um, but uh, one of the questioners wants to know your thoughts on recent developments regarding the Open Skies Treaty. You know, I, I'm of two minds on the Open Skies Treaty. Um, first, from a technical standpoint, uh, the Open Skies Treaty has less relevance than it did before. Uh, when we started this, overflights of, of territory were extremely important. 
uh, gaining the type of intelligence you needed to have confidence about uh, military um, exercises, deployments of military and so forth. Uh, we, the United States that is, have much of the technological capability to do this without open skies. We can do this through space. You know, that said, this has been an important treaty for our allies. I have to remember that this is not a bilateral uh, U.S.-Russia treaty. Uh, I think there are 30 or so other countries that are, uh, that are part of this. Uh, for some of our uh, allies uh, in Europe, NATO allies, this is an important um, element of, uh, of their intel gathering. They're feeling confident uh, that the, the Russians aren't doing things that are uh, detrimental to their security. And it also gives the Russians some confidence that they have uh, access to uh, the types of intelligence they need for their own purposes. Uh, you know, at this point, uh, when there are very few treaty relationships between the United States uh, that are focused on building trust uh, to walk away from a, uh, from a treaty uh, that in fact did that seems to be to be mistaken at this point. So if I had had my druthers, I would say um, from the political standpoint, maintaining that tie is important, should stay in the treaty. If you look at this simply from the empirical side, uh, will we lose a lot um, of um, our understanding or insight into the way op Russia operates? Absolutely no. Mm -hmm. So the technological is somewhat different from the political, but the political mm -hmm. ought to trump technological in a situation like this. Okay, great, thank you. Um, the next question is, um, to what extent do you think our withdrawal from Syria and Afghanistan will increase Putin's desire to lead Russia towards a position of greater influence in the MENA region? You know, this is always a difficult um, question to answer. Uh, you know, uh, I think we need to start from the point that, uh, that R Russia operates abroad, largely on the basis of national interest. Um, that it isn't a, a country that is simply looking for opportunities uh, to expand. Um, uh, that's one. Um, two, uh, our withdrawal from Afghanistan has different implications for Russia than our withdrawal from, uh, from the Middle East. Uh, you know, the Russians had a horrific experience in Afghanistan uh, as recently as the 1980s. Uh, there is no desire in Moscow to get re-engaged on the ground uh, in Afghanistan in a way that uh, would raise the risk of a military, uh, a military engagement. Um, there are many other countries uh, that are playing on Afghanistan at this point, the Chinese among them. Uh, Russia wants to be at the table. Uh, they want to have some say in uh, whatever the international community does, uh, either help or restructure or pressure uh, the government in, in Kabul, uh, the way Afghanistan is governed. And they also uh, have an interest as all, most of Afghanistan's neighbors do, in preventing Afghanistan from becoming uh, a haven for terrorist organizations again. But I don't see Russia as rushing in, trying to take the lead. It'll want to work inside a coalition. Uh, in the Middle East, uh, the situation is a, uh, a bit, uh, is more complex. Uh, and let me just sort of take you through uh, sort of the ev evolution in Russian thinking on the Middle East uh, from say 2015 going forward. Uh, if you go back to 2015, when Russia intervened in Syria militarily, uh, that was done, I think, as part of a larger policy to, to try to rebuild relations with the West. Uh, if you remember back to that time, Putin uh, went, spoke at the UN General Assembly uh, in the fall of 2015, talks about forming a grand counter-terrorism co counter coalition uh, of the dimensions of the a coalition against Nazi Germany during the during the Second World War. Well, that fell flat uh, in in Europe. Fell flat in the United States. Uh, but even at that point, Putin did not see Russia as a uh, as displacing the United States uh, in the Middle East. What he wanted was to for the United States to recognize Russia as a legitimate power in the Middle East, 
and to sit down and work with the United States, with Russia, the United States and Russia, in sort of managing the crisis in Syria and more broadly throughout the, uh, the Middle East. There were intensive conversations between Secretary of State of Kerry and Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov at that time over the regulation of the Syria uh, problem in particular. Uh, with, the, with the Trump administration uh, and the obvious desire on the part of the president to uh, reduce the American presence in that part of the world, I think Russian ambitions grew a little bit. And they began to see themselves as the, as the power that could sort of stir the pot in the Middle East. And what you heard people saying in Moscow was, you know, Russia is the only country that enjoys diplomatic relations and good diplomatic relations with all the major powers in the region. So we talked to the Israelis, we talked to the Turks, we talked to the Saudis, we talked to the Egyptians, we talked to the Iranians. Uh, the United States can't do that. Uh, and so we've, in a sense, become the key outside power uh, in, in this part of the world. Uh, you know, I think if you look at it from today's perspective, you know, not so much. Um, yes, they do have all these different, uh, these different types of relationships, but it turns out the Middle East is really a very difficult uh, area to, uh, to manage, uh, even if you have all the power and wealth of the United States, uh, that you're dealing with uh, countries that have a very deep uh, uh, views about themselves, the role in the world is very competitive, uh, the divisions are deep-seated, long-lasting, uh, and so it's not something that a single outside power can do. Uh, so I think Russia is a little less sanguine about its ability to manage uh, this, a little less sanguine about its ability to bring the conflict in Syria uh, to a, uh, an acceptable conclusion of some sort. Uh, and my guess is uh, at some point in the not too distant future, uh, they would love to see a United States back in the region that would share that burden with them. But I think we're two or three years removed from that. Uh, at this point, I think we'll see the Russians uh, trying a little bit of this, a little bit of that, but not uh, eager to get more deeply into the, uh, the diplomacy of the Middle East than they are at this point, even if the United States withdraws uh, to a greater extent than it has already. Great. Th th thank you for that. We're, we're almost up on time. So, so I'd like just, just one, one final question, if I may. Um, you've obviously spent a lot of time working in Russia, going back and forth and, you know, trying to understand the country. What's one thing that you think that um, those of us who are listening who are in the United States don't understand about Russia that we should? Well, I'd, I'd like to say that, um, uh, you know, one, that they're normal people, uh, but put the Russians to the, uh, uh, as a people to decide, I think, um, uh, you can say a lot that's very positive about them. Uh, I think the important thing uh, to remember uh, is that Russia operates, the Kremlin operates largely on the basis of national interest, uh, that their goal in the world uh, is not necessarily to, to counter the United States everywhere in the world. Uh, there is a tendency in this country to think it's all about us, uh, and everything that the Kremlin does is somehow related to what it's trying to do to us. Um, I don't think that's the case at all. There are a lot of other considerations that come into play. I think it's clear uh, that Russia would like the United States uh, to play a less prominent role in world affairs. They don't want us to disappear. They want us to act as a great power that realizes that it has to deal with Russia uh, as a great power. Uh, but Russia also thinks about China. They also think about the Europeans. They also think about what's happening in the Middle East. Uh, and they would think about those things no matter what the state of the relationship was with the United States. And in many ways, uh, any Russian leader would be pursuing a set of policies that aren't radically different from the ones uh, that Putin is pursuing in creating problems for the United States. Um, so uh, think in terms of national interest. Mm -hmm. uh, remember that it's not all about us. Um, and I think uh, you're on a way to understanding Russia a bit better. Those are, are, are good words to live by, I think, in any situation. So um, at any rate, Tom, thank you so much for, for joining us today. It was a real pleasure to speak with you. And thank you for um, 
giving us so much information. And as you all have just seen, uh, a poll has just popped up because we're trying to understand, uh, get, get a sense from participants uh, what you think about these briefings because we've been doing a lot of them and we want to be able to do more. Um, you know, just a quick note, our next one is on Monday at 11 a.m. and that's with Anthony Philipson, the British Consul General uh, in New York, and he will be talking about the U.S.-U.K. Uh, trade relationship, among other things, so it should be really, really, I think, an interesting and timely talk. Um, and we have others that we're continually putting on our website. Um, and, and just a, a, a plea and a, and a thank you. Um, we're trying to offer all of these briefings free of charge to anyone who's around the world. And um, you know, thank you to those who have already donated. And if you're listening and uh, feel it in your heart and ability to donate, we would greatly appreciate it because we've been thrilled by the online community that we've been able to form. So. Um, with that, Tom, thank you again. Um, I hope you're able to get back to Russia before too long, and um, and hopefully we'll be able to speak again at some point. Take care. Thank you very much. It was my right, pleasure. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.